Okay. Uh, and then Commissioner Wade. Here. Wonderful. Okay. So here, I'm just going to go back to, to Commissioner Thompson, if, if, if you can say that you're here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm, doing I'm, I'm, not hearing, I'm not hearing by the computer, but I'm on my phone. Okay, great. I can great. see everybody. Cool. And then, um, so, yeah, so we have we have a quorum. Okay. Fantastic. How about if call-in users, and hopefully can call-in users see your name on the screen or not? Now you're probably calling in, so you're probably not having a screen. So why don't we ask people on the phone uh, to identify themselves? I don't know how else to do this. Uh, we'll do the best we can. So if you're on the phone, please identify yourself now. My name is Dion Smith. My name is Dion Smith. My name is Dr. Mucharafi. Mike Saladin. Bill Foley. Dr. Minichi. Sorry, I heard of Bill somebody, but I didn't get your last name, Bill. Foley. Before Mr. Domenici was Brockman, J.I.M. Brockman. Got it, Mr. Brockman. Thank you. Thank you. Ariel O'Callaghan. This is Rachel Khan. Chris Seahill, Office of General Counsel, New Mexico Environment Department. Steve Underetta Royal. Michelle Hunter. I see Jason Herman. Jason Herman, hi. Let me see. Let me see. Commissioner Thompson, I, I believe that your people need to mute. They may have to mute their phone, but if you don't mute, you'll get a lot of background noise and a lot of people. Okay, I also see John Verhuel, Jennifer Fulham, I see Kelly Noakes, Kim Steven. I see Miguel Montoya. I see Robert Sanchez, who is our counsel. Is there anybody else on the line that uh, we have not identified. Steve and Loretta Real. Yes, Steve and Loretta Real, we have you. And I'm Jerome Hanson. My take can't see them in my video, but I'm Jerome Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. We see you. I see Bill Brancard also. Again, anybody else that we that we do have not noted as being on this WebEx meeting by either phone or video? Deputy, we also have Diana Aradna from uh, uh, Surface Water and NMED. Thank you. All right, I think we have everybody then. So um, we have a quorum and we can proceed. So this is the process that I'm 
plan and on. Again, please mute your, your speaker at the left bottom of your screen. It should be red if you're muted, it's black if you're speaking. And please mute yourself except when you are speaking, and this will really help lower the amount of our background noise. Secondly, um, I want you to know that we have consulted with the Attorney General Open Government Division, and they've advised us that we can hold meetings virtually like this uh, if the Board or Commission has a time-sensitive matter pending, which we do at this meeting. Uh, we felt that uh, matter 20-14 pending motion to stay was a time-sensitive matter, and also uh, they, their request for hearing must be scheduled within 90 days, so we, uh, we went ahead and scheduled this meeting this way. Uh, if you have technical difficulties now or during the meeting, uh, it would be best to contact our IT staff, Lori Gasta of the Environment Department's IT staff, is on call and available for you if you have technical problems. Our number is 505-231-0914. Um, Cody is being administrator during this meeting, so he's not the best person. I'm going to say Lori Gaspis phone number one more time, 505-231-0914. So all our normal rules of decorum and everybody behaving professionally still apply, even though there's a little screen between all of us. I will allow the usual time for public comment. Uh, if you wish to make a public comment, please wait until I've opened the meeting for the public comment. I will give the parties an opportunity to speak about the pending motion that's on the agenda. We've had a couple of calls and questions asking that, so the answer is yes. We are really going to have to try to only speak one at a time so that the microphone uh, that's taping this can record properly and so we can all understand. And please identify yourselves when you speak. Um, those of you in video contact have your names under your picture, but we have a lot of call-in users who can't see that. So it's very important to say who you are, which I neglected to do. I am Jennifer Pruitt, the chair of the commission. My apologies. We will do all votes today by roll call vote. Our admission administrator, Cody Barn, will read the roll alphabetically as he just did so everybody can hear how each commissioner voted on each matter. And this meeting is being recorded both by WebEx and I believe Cody also has our normal tape recorder going. Um, that's the requirement for virtual and in-person meetings, and I want to reassure everyone we do have that technology going. So, first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda for today, which I, has been posted on our website, and I hope everyone is aware of that. So, I will entertain a motion on the agenda. Real Wade, I move to you. Yep. I'll be ready. All right. Does anyone have any comments or discussion on the agenda? Not seeing any, I will ask Cody to read the roll for approving the agenda. Okay, so Commissioner Candelaria. Uh, aye. Commissioner Certain. Yes. Commissioner Dominguez. Yes. Commissioner McWilliams. Yes. Commissioner Musharafi. Yes. Commissioner Patton. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair Pruitt? Yes. 
Commissioner Rader. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Cipher. Yes. Commissioner Thompson. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Timmons. Yes. And Commissioner Wade. Yes. It passes unanimously. All right. Thank you for that. The second item on our agenda is approval of the minutes from March 10th. Uh, those have all been sent out to commissioners. I have a couple of corrections to those minutes. Um, primarily, it involves conforming um, the minutes so that all the actions taken are consistently shown as having occurred in the past tense rather than the present tense. So, for example, on page 3, line 115, instead of saying the motion passes, it would say the motion passed. Same correction, page 3, number 1, line 123 for that motion. Um, some typos uh, on page 4, lines 139, 140, so that it would read Commissioner Dominguez moved to set a hearing on the matter to be held on June 8, 2020 in Santa Fe. Uh, same page 4, line 168, hearing officer Pruitt explained the hearing process. Page 5, line 191, the motion passed 12 to 0. And then on that last page, on the action item, I uh, moved it around a little bit so it will say Commission, Administrator, or Ortiz mentioned there were no upcoming matters yet for the April 14, 2020 meeting. Chair Pruitt discussed that the meeting may be canceled. If there is a lack of business, no action was taken. So those are my corrections to the minutes. Does anyone else have any additions, corrections, edits to the March 10th meeting minutes? Hearing and seeing none, I will entertain a motion. Adam Chair, Commissioner. Yes. A couple of couple of items um, on page three. The vote that was taken, starting with line one oh nine. I'm not seeing Commissioner Cipher listed within the votes taken. And the same thing with starting on line 117 of page 3. I do not see Commissioner Cipher listed there. Yet we have an 11 to 1 vote on both those. So I'm thinking Commissioner Cipher was left out of the inadvertently left out of those two items. And then I have the same thing showing on page 5, starting on line 185. We have a 12 to 0 vote there. And Commissioner Cipher is not listed in the program. Has left the meeting. And maybe it would be helpful um, to make sure that Commissioner Cipher was there for those votes, as I recall he was. But if he could interject, please. 
Commissioner Cipher? Yes, I was there, and um, I I did, in, in fact, on the last uh, motion of the day, I was voting in the affirmative. And do you recall voting on the other two matters as well in the affirmative? Yeah, I, I do not remember being uh, opposed to any of those. I had contrary comments during the discussion, um, but after considering everybody else's input, I voted in the affirmative. That's my recollection as well, and I apologize uh, that I didn't catch that in the, minute, in the minutes and that you were left off that we will make that correction. You know, we had our we had a, a substitute uh, administrator at that meeting who has not done these minutes before and is not as familiar with all the commissioners as Cody is. So again, I apologize for that error. With all, does anyone else have any other? Uh, and thank you, Commissioner Dominguez, once again for your eagle eyes catching that. Uh, do we have any other additions or corrections to the amendment? Hi, Madam Chair. This is Howard. Hi. Hey, Howard. Um, I was on my phone uh, for the last vote, but I didn't hear Cody call my name. And so I wanted to make sure that I voted aye on approval of the agenda. I have no further corrections for the minutes. Good, good catch on both yours and Commissioner Dominguez's part. Thank you. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes as corrected? Uh, Madam Chair, one, one second. There is also a misspelling of Mr. Dominici's name on line 89, which is page 3. To correct it from D O M I N I C I to D O M E N I C I. Thank you. I had that as well, and I miss saying that. Yes, we will correct that. I would need to approve minutes with the correction as opposed to do we have a second? David Certain seconds the motion. Thank you, Commissioner Certain. Cody, would you please call the roll for the vote? <laughs> yes. All righty, Commissioner Candelaria. Yes. Commissioner Certain. Yes. Commissioner Dominguez. Yes. Commissioner Hutchinson. Yes. Commissioner McWilliams. Yes. Commissioner Musharafi. Yes. Commissioner Patton. Yes. Madam Chair Pruitt. Yes. Commissioner Rader. Yes. Commissioner Cipher. Yes. Commissioner Thompson. Yes. Commissioner Timmons. Yes. And Commissioner Wade. Yes. All righty, Madam Chair, passes. Very good. Thank you. So we've taken care of the minutes. So now the next item on our agenda is the time when I ask members of the public if they would like to provide a public comment on something. And this is not comment on anything that is on the agenda. It is just general public comment if someone wants to say something to the commission. So is there anyone out there that would like to make a public comment at this time? Rachel, Han? 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is Rachel Kahn. I'm with Anivos Bravos. We're a statewide water protection organization. And I wanted to thank the Commission and the Administrator for making this possible. I think that this, in fact, actually is an easier way for the public to participate and attend the WQCC meeting. And I would urge the Commission to continue this format um, even for matters that aren't deemed emergency or, you know, time sensitive. Um, and so that I just, I'll end and, and thank you for, for putting this together and making it easy for the public to join. Thank you, Rachel. It's really, I really appreciate having that feedback that, that this format is working for, for you and your organization. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to make a public comment at this time? And this could be someone on the phone that I can't see. I'm not hearing anybody speak up, so um, I, unless I hear pretty quickly from someone, I'll assume my answer is no. All right. The ne next item on our agenda number five is to adopt an open meeting fact resolution for 2020. Uh, the commission had a very spirited and lengthy discussion about this at our March 10th meeting. But unfortunately, due to a number of uh, technical teleworking challenges, uh, Council Sanchez and I were not able to get a revised uh, open meeting back resolution to the commissioners uh, last week, and I wanted my I insisted that commissioners get that a, at least a week before the meeting to give everybody a chance to really go over that in some detail because it had been such uh, a concern for commissioners at our last meeting. So what I suggest at this point is that we just temporarily adopt exactly what we adopted in 2019, only changing the date, the members, uh, the name of the com and contact information of the commission administrator until we can get a revised resolution adopted. I hope that will be at our next meeting. But again, you know, depending on technical difficulties and pending business, um, I apologize we didn't get that to you now, and I hope we can get that to you soon. I, I would feel better if we had something in place. So um, I ask if any commissioners want to comment on that or, or make other suggestions. Uh, Madam Chair, this uh, is Larry Dominguez. I think um, your suggestion is very prudent. That way we have something on the books to indicate that we've put something in place, even if it's just on an interim basis, and the fact that uh, it would be last year's resolution, I think that um, is a safer approach, uh, even if it is just on an interim basis. So with that, I would um, make a motion that we revise the 2019 resolution, as you indicated, and to have that in place until we take any further action. Second from Commissioner Hutchinson. Any other discussion from commissioners on this? Uh, Council Sanchez, is there anything you want to add to this uh, discussion or any advice you want to provide on this? Do 
we have Council Robert Sanchez on the line? Hear me? Uh, now I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I was just basically recapping what you and I have done in brief. Uh, what, we've, what we've done is we've taken the draft that I last circulated at the March 10th meeting, the 2019 resolution that had been adopted previously by the Commission, and all the comments that were made by the commissioners at the last meeting, primarily those of Commissioner Dominguez, and we have uh, a, a very, I think, good working draft. And again, because of uh, technical difficulties, we were able to finalize that, but the commission will be rest assured that we will have a final draft to the commission in ample time before the next meeting for their review and comment. Thank you. Thank you, Council. All right. Well, we have a motion and a second. Uh, doesn't sound like we have any other discussion. Cody, would you please call the roll vote on that, please? Of course. Uh, Commissioner Candelario. Uh, yes. Commissioner Sturton. Yes. Commissioner Dominguez. Yes. Commissioner Hutchinson. Yes. Commissioner McWilliams. Yes. Commissioner Musharafi. Yes. Commissioner Patton. Yes. Madam Chair Pruitt. Yes. Commissioner Rader. Yes. Commissioner Cipher. Yes. Commissioner Thompson. Yes. Commissioner Timmons? Yes. And Commissioner Wade? Yes. Madam Chair, it passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. I'm glad we got that taken care of. So next on our agenda, number six, is WQCC number 20-14A in the matter of the petition for hearing on the renewal of septic disposal facility discharge permit. DP-465 for SMR septic. And just to confirm that we have the parties here, we have uh, Pete Domenici, Jr., counsel for SMR septic. We have, do we have Owen Johnson, counsel for the Environment Department? Yes, I'm here. We have Jim, James Brockman, counsel for El Prado Water and Sanitation District. Yes, I'm on the phone. All right, thank you. And we have Jerome Hansen. Yes, I'm here. And Dion Smith. Yes, I'm here. All right, very good. Uh, I know we also have the uh, permittees and a number of interested members of the public who are on the line as well. We don't need to go through those names at this time. Um, so the first thing I believe we need to discuss, commissioners, is the request for hearing in this matter, and secondly, the motion to stay. Uh, because if we aren't going to grant the motion for hearing, we don't need to worry about the motion to stay. So, um, commissioners, discussion on the request for hearing. Madam Chair, this is Kelsey Rader, uh, Commissioner Rader. I wanted to say off the bat, having reviewed the record, that uh, definitely I'm concerned about some of the points brought up by the public comments in the Secretary's order, uh, specifically on the level that Ms. Maitre is being found. Uh, however, the petitioner's claim concerning communication with any staff would substantively inform any findings that we have on the Secretary's order. And so I'm generally inclined to grant the petitioner's motion to stay the implementation of the order and remand the case back to the hearing officer. Okay, hold on. Um, so you're saying you don't think we should have a, a hearing on the on the petition? 
Excuse me, Madam Chair, I'm agreeing with you that we should have a hearing on the petition. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anybody else? All right, I'm also inclined to grant this petition. Um, I suggest that um, we appoint Richard Virtue as the hearing officer. We haven't had him as the hearing officer in a, for a couple of cases. Um, we have hearings scheduled already in June uh, on the Canon Compliance Order Appeal in July on the Construction Programs Bureau rulemaking, reducing their loan interest rate. But I, I don't think the July matter is going to take too much time. And I, I, I think maybe we could do this SNR hearing uh, at that meeting as well if commissioners are amenable to that schedule. So um, any discussion or motion on that? Um, Chair Pruitt, this is Commissioner Dominguez. More of a question or discussion as part of that petition. The petitioner had questions whether some documents were not available to be responded to during that petition and reference whether something needed to be remanded back or the record be opened in order to be for the petitioner to respond to items brought up by the secretary. So I'm throwing that out for this discussion purposes of whether there's anything that needs to be placed in the record prior to going to the hearing. And I guess I'll follow that up with the, or will that get fleshed out by the arguments that are made by both parties coming before the hearing. I think there's going to be plenty of time for discussion in the hearing about whether the Secretary's order was um, supported by substantial evidence in the record or not. And I expect that to be a topic of discussion in the hearing. Uh, the fact that the Secretary used a provision in the Water Quality Act that a party feels that they did not properly address during the hearing, uh, I think is something they can argue in their appeal. But uh, I think looking at the order and the hearing officer report, I, I think there's enough uh, to proceed the hearing and I'm not inclined to, to send it back for more evidence. So do I have a motion to put this on our, to schedule a hearing in July and appoint Mr. Virtue uh, as the hearing officer to manage the proceedings up to and during the hearing. Commissioner Hutchinson, so moved. Gabriel Wade, I would second. All right, commissioners, any additional discussion on this? Not hearing any, Cody, would you please call a roll call vote on this? Yes, of course. Uh, Commissioner Candelaria. Yes. Commissioner Sturton. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Dominguez. Yes. 
Commissioner Hutchinson? Yes. Commissioner McWilliams? Yes. Commissioner Musharafi? Yes. Commissioner Patton? Yes. Uh, Madam Chair Pruitt? Yes. Commissioner Rader? Yes. Commissioner Spicer? Yes. Commissioner Thompson? Yes. Commissioner Timmons? Yes. And Commissioner Wade? All right, so we have a hearing scheduled in that matter, and that means we will now move to discuss the motion to stay. That motion was made by uh, Mr. Domenici, so Mr. Domenici, would you like to proceed? Yes, I would, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so for a, um, generally speaking, a stay while a matter is on appeal uh, is governed by four, four elements that the tribunal, like you, uh, you know, we, we being asked to decide for the stay looks at. And this, this is actually established in a, uh, in an appeal of a Water Quality Control Commission decision back in 1986 in the Black Letter Law in New Mexico. So in order for us, my clients, to be eligible for stay, they need to show that they have a likelihood that they will prevail on the merits of the appeal. Now that phrase, likelihood, has been interpreted uh, not to mean a probability, but to mean that the appeal is not frivolous and there is uh, some, uh, some merit to the appeal. I would say the fact that uh, the secretary overruled the hearing officer in and of itself establishes a likelihood, which is a, a, some, some chance we will prevail. I would also point out that uh, Jason Herman would ask whether uh, the SNR renewal application satisfied the exact requirements of the, the Water Quality Act that the, that the Secretary relied on. So this is the inspector, permit writer, and the only witness for the Groundwater Bureau, and he testified yes, that uh, there were no compliance issues justifying using the, the provisions that the Secretary then, then used. So we not only have the hearing officer, we have the Groundwater Bureau, both supporting renewal of the permit. Then on top of that, I would suggest, and first of all, I, uh, two other points on the likelihood. One, it's since this decision, which frankly was shocking, because I've, I've been involved in, in permit hearings for a long time. I had, a, I had one permit where this occurred. The secretary overruled the hearing officer and the, the, that was, uh, didn't have any compliance issues. It was basically a, a monitoring program and some construction details for a new permit. And the commission overruled Secretary Curry on that one. And then in a public records request that I just got a response to, there's only one other instance where a secretary is overruled, where basically a secretary has denied a permit. That case, there was a specific order from the Bureau to a dairy to discontinue operating. And the dairy did not discontinue. And there was a finding that there was actual contamination of groundwater and surface water. And the uh, hearing officer did not make any recommendation. She did not recommend, like we have in this case, that the permit be renewed. So that is the only other precedent out there, and it is completely at a different level of significance of the violations and no hearing officer recommendation to support it. And as you know, when you, when you hear this appeal, you are, uh, by, by your rules, 
you are supposed to consider the record, and you're supposed to consider the hearing officer's recommendation. So by, by your own regulations, the hearing officer recommend, recommendation receives significant weight. The last point I'll make on likelihood of success is that in the denial of the permit, the secretary made a completely inaccurate finding start off his list of violations. Uh, and it's completely contradicted by a, a letter in the record which he refused to cite. So he says his first statement on page 15 is, although its 2012 discharge permit expired on December 27, 2017, the applicant continued to operate the facility, thereby discharging without a permit in violation of the Water Act and regulations. Contrary to that, and immediately uh, in, in item 32 in the record, is the letter from the Bureau Chief dated December 19, 2018, uh, that had pointed out that the uh, permit had expired and the renewal was being filed uh, not within the, the time where you automatically get it to operate under the old permit. And this is what the, the, the Bureau Chief and I would strongly suggest the Bureau Chief, the Bureau, and the Hearing Officer are much closer to the reality of the permit than the Secretary. But what, what Michelle Hunter said, many factors influence how the Department engages a permittee with an expired permit, including the degree to which the permittee cooperates with the Department. As documented in your letter, the department issued a notice of noncompliance in August 2018 outlining several violations, permit violations. Since that time, SNR Septic has been corresponding regularly with the department and sectors, is working towards compliance with conditions of the permit. In essence, the permittee is now engaged in the standard permit renewal process. For this reason, the department Note that's the department talking there, not just the Bureau, would consider this closing the business to be premature. This approach is consistent with previous Groundwater Quality Bureau actions for other permittees in similar circumstances. By issuing the facility an administrative compliance order to cease discharging, the groundwater would be treating SNR septic in a different and unusual fashion, which is exactly what the Secretary has done, which is arbitrary and capricious, which violates my client's due process rights, and which shows that he is being selected, really, frankly, overreaching selective in his choice of what to pull out of the administrative record. For him not to cite that letter that speaks for the Bureau and the Department and clearly allows continued operation is uh, more than an oversight. It's a statement that he is trying to make policy in this decision, not regulate even-handedly. He is targeting my clients who have been in business 33 years, and if you can imagine, commissioners, what it's like to be all accepted in the middle of winter and throughout winter in Cowes County and, and the vicinity, this is not an easy business. This is a very, very difficult business, and it's a very valuable local business. So I would respectfully suggest there is no question that there is a sufficient likelihood of success uh, to grant a stay. Number two is we need to show irreparable harm to the applicant unless the stay is granted. In his order, the, the final statement the secretary makes is, and this is, Dave, this is his order of February 19th, he states, the permittee shall begin closure of the facility consistent with the provisions of the discharge permit and provisions of the groundwater regulations. By the time we reach this hearing and earlier, there will, there will be conditions that in a, say my client chose to close the facility, it would be appropriate to close the facility. They haven't occurred yet because of the winter and the mud and other basically weather-related circumstances. But without a stay and with this 
completely overreaching and unprecedented uh, policy statement, which is, in my position, is really the Secretary testifying in this decision. I will point that out in my brief. Um, he wants us to basically destroy this facility before we have a chance of appeal. That's completely unreasonable. That is irreparable harm. If my clients prevail on the appeal, which we expect to, they will have already lost their facility. They've utilized this facility for 33 years. There's absolutely no harm in keeping it open until the hearing in July. Uh, yes, the Secretary has ordered that. So I respectfully request that the order to close the facility should certainly be stayed. With respect to operating at the facility, my client stopped immediately uh, on the February 19th, taking steps to the facility. They are suffering irreparable harm several ways by taking that uh, sewage or septage to the uh, City of South facility. First, the City of South facility, and this was testified at the hearing, is not capable of handling all of the septage in that community. The septage haulers have to wait two hours to dump a load. The, uh, the, 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 there's, no, there's no meter for high volume flows where you can dump the tank quickly. There's a very slow meter, so it, because of the equipment itself, it takes two hours to dump a load. There is more septage right now and in the last four or five weeks than there ever is in this time of year, and that's to the, uh, corona, due to the coronavirus and people staying at home. And then as we get closer to the summer, the septage volume will increase, which but the, the result of that is septic uh, tanks are being um, cleaned less frequently than is the best situation to preserve the, the uh, integrity of the septic system and also to um, treat the septage and to allow the, the systems to act like they're supposed to in treatment. Finally, my client will never make up the revenue that he he and she, it's a husband and wife, Steve and Loretta, that they are losing now by not being able to uh, dump at their facility. And if, if people have read the decision, there is no indication of environmental harm in this decision. Unlike the the other one other case where this was done, uh, there was a there was groundwater and surface water contamination occurring. So I think I respectfully suggest that since we're not going to have a hearing until July, my client should be allowed to operate the facility. And this, and there was testimony at the hearing, and a question and answer by myself and Mr. Herman: How would the the bureau uh, inspect the facility now, since they are in this expired permit permit application process, and the uh, Testimony was they would be inspected under their old permit, which is exactly how they would operate at this time. And that's testimony in the record, and that's how they've been treated throughout um, operating while they've had this expired permit. They've been inspected. They've been held to the 2012 permit. They would be held to the 2012 permit for operating until we get a decision from the commission. The uh, few other elements are Evidence that no substantial harm will result to other interested persons. Um, interested persons include the septage customers. All of them are being harmed. My, my client has 50% of business approximately. And the other 50% are able to dump in this city of South facility. But with my client dumping there too, everyone is slowed down. All of the septage is slowed in this community. The price has gone up since the this decision. So there's been a lot of uh, harm to the community. There will be no substantial harm to interested parties to allow this facility to operate it as it has for 33 years. It, it, has given, it has received more and more restrictions. The 2012 permit allowed only a shallow layer to be uh, disposed of. The uh, Part of the hearing was how much of that evaporates, which is a substantial percentage. So there's um, uh, there's a good process in place. There was no finding, and there has been no finding of harm of interested parties by the secretary or by the hearing officer. Yes, people don't like this facility. 
They all moved to the facility. There's aerial photos showing this facility in the middle of nowhere when it started, and it's been encroaching on. So I think the third element we proved, and then the last is showing that no harm will ensue to the public interest. And I would suggest there's no harm, there's no discussion of harm to the public interest by the secretary. There's no showing of harm to the public interest. There is, in fact, an overreaching treating uh, permit compliance assistance, which occurs regularly by the Bureau and across the 2,000 or so permits, infusing that with permit noncompliance. Uh, but there is, in fact, no, no uh, harm to the public interest to allowing my client to operate and not close and to let them get a, a have the hearing assistance schedule. So uh, with that, uh, uh, that's all I have at this time. Madam Hearing Officer and Commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Domenici. Mr. Johnson, would you like to make uh, any remarks next? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you, Madam Commissioner and members of the Commission. I, I, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. I agree with Mr. Domenici that the test is a, a four-factor analysis that stems from the Tenneco oil uh, decision. Uh, I think it's important to point out that that decision also made clear that, yes, the burden of proof is on the petitioner here, that the applicant for the motion must make a showing of each factor. Um, when it comes to the first factor about the likelihood to prevail on the merits, I the department argues that that is unlikely because the secretary's decision was based on a non-discretionary statute that has, by its plain language, um, it uses the word shall rather than may, so it is strong and requires that certain circumstances occur within 10 years prior to the application for the permit that the permit shall be denied. It's not optional. Scenarios, uh, there's about six of them that can ha happen within the 10 prior years. The secretary cited two of them. One, uh, it's adjacent that it has to do with misrepresenting facts. It was actually adjudicated in the Court of Appeals and Summers versus uh, the WTCC. And that talked about mainly what it had to decide was whether or not the misrepresentation had occurred within the prior 10 years. Once they decided that it had, there was no question or any debate that that permit had to be denied. And this is one of the six as our, one of the six reasons, uh, within that statute that the Secretary relied upon as well. So I believe it would be the same circumstance here. Uh, that decision, Summers versus WTCC, went on to further describe how the, it represented the seriousness of the legislative intent uh, that elsewhere within the same statute is considered that kind of misrepresentation to be a fourth degree felony. Uh, within that same part listing the felonies, we can see that um, criminal penalties also apply to discharging without a permit, violating a condition of a permit, or failing to monitor sent or report as required by a permit. So the legislative intent is clear that they're very serious that if somebody has been a bad actor in regards to environmental compliance that they are not supposed to be permitted. Another case that uh, talked about these factors was Ticket Ranch LLP versus Curry, which mainly addressed what would be the threshold for willful disregard in an environmental context. And there, they were clear that the Secretary has very wide discretion to decide that. I quote, we think the Secretary is in the best position to determine what constitutes the history of noncompliance sufficient to warrant the denial of a permit, as long as the Secretary's decision is supported by substantial evidence and not unreasonable, we will affirm it. So once it got to the Secretary for this order to be, to be decided upon, he had a, a very wide range of discretion to decide if that actions of that are septic rose to that level, and he did so. As for factor two about irreconcilable harm, New Mexico, New Mexico is a city of Sunland Park is a 
is a case of an irreparable harm of an injury that is without adequate remedy at law. It talks about how it has to be something that cannot be compensated for monetarily. So right now, given the, the order that we're discussing, there's some question whether it creates harm of any kind, much less of an irreparable sort. And that is because even if there's a stay on the Secretary's order, it won't return the, the petitioner into a legal position where they could discharge. They haven't had a valid permit for two years now. As Mr. Domenici mentioned, there has been some enforcement discretion along the way, uh, such as the letter that he talked about, where the Bureau did try its best to work with, with the petitioner. And that has been understanding that their narrow focus of what they should do is to try and get somebody into compliance. So ultimately, it remains the Secretary's decision if, uh, if a permit should be denied, and if by the time it reached him, there had been some other issues of non-compliance that would factor into his decision, such as testing for oil and grease that showed that despite it being illegal for that to be disposed of at the SNR septic site, was 100 times cleaner than testing disposed of at other locations. These are things that come into question even further as the non-compliance. So getting back to if there is a, a potential harm, it's not it's not irreparable because it's completely measurable. SNR septic is a standard business. It's been uh, operational for 33 years. It provides a service for a measurable price. They've been around long enough to know what their average day-to-day -day income would be. If they have some sort of harm, it would be strictly pecuniary, and they could repair that kind of taking whatever legal action they might need to recover money. So it's measurable, and that means it would not fit the definition of irreparable harm according to New Mexico versus City of Sunland Park. Also, Mr. Demancy mentioned that the order talks about closure of the facility and destroying it. I think we all understand the proper connotation there is simply that it's not to be used. The petitioner is still free to pump and to haul, and as they're doing, apparently, take it to another facility such as the treatment plant. If anything about that costs a little more money in gas or access fees, that's also measurable and can be compensated later. As for point number three about harm to other interested parties, we know that the stagecoach Homeowners Association and Mr. Dion Smith, Jerome Hanson, El Prado, Water and Sanitation are all concerned about this, that there's been all kinds of public comment and letters written to the department about the situation. The reason that this site can potentially be dangerous is that new information has come out that is called the, the lithology and the geology and the hydrology beneath the site in the question, and that uncertainty combined with the fact that the petitioner discharges a higher density of septage per acre than any other septage discharger in the state makes it a questionable situation where it would require further proof to show that there's not going to be harm to the groundwater. And that's why in the original um, agreement between the two parties, there was a requirement to further explore beneath the site. And, and if it turns out that it was as polluted as some suspect it would have to shut down at that point. As for factor number four about the public interest, this is not well defined in the state of New Mexico what constitutes that factor, but there is some good guidance at the federal level. Uh, there's a case called National Propane Gas Association versus the Department of Homeland Security, as well as Hunter versus the Federal Energy Regula Regulatory Commission, and they both talk about how in a democracy where a legislator, legis democratically elected legislature has passed a statute that then delegates authority to a agency with its expertise to enforce on a certain matter, to overturn that enforcement is in and of itself contrary to the public interest because the public has an interest through its 
democratically elected legislatures and the, the laws that they pass and having those actually followed and enforced. That is the, the most consistent definition of public interest that I've seen. As far as the Secretary not accepting that his decision, that's understandable. It's a factor here. It's more important to whether or not we're going to uphold or deny a motion than to his decision. As for potential harm to the community because there's increased septage or, or septic tank aren't being emptied properly, uh, a look at the Taos phone book shows there's at least seven other septic haulers in that area, and they would potentially have an increase in business, and that's just the nature of commerce. Um, if, if the petitioner is going to the wastewater treatment facility, well, all of them do too. That's just a, other than the petitioner who is an exception to the rule, actually. That is the normal way to do things in that environment. There's nobody else that's a septic hauler up there that has to have a discharge permit because they don't put it on the surface of the ground. Also, um, I believe that, that's all I have for arguments at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Owen Johnson. Um, next, uh, we'll go to Jim Brockman, who represents El Prado. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, on behalf of El Prado, their interest is more in the conditions of approval that were approved at the hearing itself and um, whether or not the facility will continue long term so that the district is not taking the position uh, where it opposes or is in favor of the motion to stay and will be in line with whatever decision is reached by, uh, by the commission in that regard and, and will hold substantive comments until we get to the hearing itself. That's all we have for our product today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brockman. Um, I think next we have Dion Smith. Would you like to make any comments on the motion to stay, Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith, are you still on the line? Yes, I am, Madam Secretary. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Um, at the hearing, I spoke of, uh, it's not on, in, included in the New Mexico environmental regulations, but the research on air contamination is not being recognized in this process, apparently. And when we talk about harm, there is harm, there has been harm to people who are in, nearby this facility. I spoke that this is not new information. I spoke about that the um, bylaws have been changed. We would not allow a facility like that to be constructed or implemented in this neighborhood. Now there are over 100 homes here, residences here. We had a couple of residents, one in particular, where the mother had to remove her kids from the house because of symptoms from air contamination. Um, so, and the other beef that I have is that Mr. Real can use the water facility, the treatment facility in town, and we visited that, and they state that they have no problem handling the amount of waste that is being dumped here, and, uh, and that's all I have at this time. On the, mo on the motion to stay. I would like uh, Mr. Real continue to dump for two years without a permit. I believe that the motion to stay should be denied.
Thank you. Uh, are those, is, is that the extent of your comments, Mr. Hansen? That is was Mr. Smith speaking. Mr. Hansen did not speak yet. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. Thank you. Are you done, Mr. Smith, or do you have anything else? No, I would also, uh, uh, you know, take consideration that we also have this virus going on right now, and to be dumping waste there at this time would not be prudent as well. I'm done, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Smith. Mr. Hanson. Yes, I've got um, and. I'm in opposition to points uh, four and five of the petitioner's motion today. I thought I'd just read points four and then my, op my uh, opposition to it. And then I'll read point five, read my opposition to it. That's okay. So point four was the WQCC is now found by the Secretary of Claim the fact law. So consider recommendations for the hearing off. It sure has a strong likelihood to prevail on appeal. This should be granted to the search permit as recommended by the hearing officer. My opposition is the hearing officer was really troubled by numerous episodes of non compliance of the but she had to rule on a rather narrow basis of contamination groundwater by the district. The burden of proof for demonstrating that the groundwater is safe should be the responsibility of the petitioner. This determination has never been done. Even more. Point five is the facility has operated for 33 years and has had at least five permit applications and renewals approved by NMED. Closing the facility prior to final decision by the WQCC will cause irreversible and irreparable harm. Furthermore, the task community and both residents will suffer irreparable harm if that service is to conduct the decision. That's a suspension proposal. My uh, opposition to that is that the facility has indeed operated for nine years over the strong infection community. However, the last two years of operation have been illegal, according to the Secretary of State, that there was no permit. Previous <coughs> permit approval was granted in part to depth of water greater than 500 feet. Therefore, the groundwater was thought to be safe for contamination because of the long length of time it would take to which contact the groundwater. However, only within the present permit process as the high permeability of the rock intervals in the surface of the water can acknowledge. 65%, two thirds of the question, highly permeable, briefly fractured, every earth of the fall. The ubiquitous fractures and joints in the fall form, and then the gravel in the middle of the fall, enable rapid downward movement of the creek water towards the water. The current allows us in our septic to gain a competitive which all in South County charges dollar regional wastewater treatment. Mr. Hansen? Yes. It, it, we're having some difficulty hearing you. Could you sit a little bit, maybe just scoot a little closer to your microphone and repeat the last portion that you were talking about? Uh, after the variability and permeability of the soils? I sure can. Can you hear me now? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. The permit allows this and our septic to be a competitive business advantage over the other food haulers in South County. We discharge the past Valley Regional Wastewater Treatment Reclamation Facility. This new state of the art facility has considerable unused capacity. It is a easily processed and disposable sewage that the SNR discharges regularly in the area. Taxpayers are justifiably outraged in the sewage is being dumped on the ground so that one company profits 
other than merely utilizing the, the use capacity of water. First of all, the sewage dump by SR is never treated. Uh, the, the change in treatment occurred really uh, in, in July of 1999 when these uh, pits were originally designated as sewage treatment septic ponds, which were treated by microbial activity. Um, but their, their designation is changed to cell disposal. As you have pointed out, in this time of heightened awareness about the transmissibility of airborne pathogens, residents and businesses in the house community, particularly those residents and employees nearby, should not have to accept the risk of a large source of airborne pathogens. That is, let alone a risk to their drinking water. The community will suffer irreparable harm if permit is reinstated. Pits are allowed to remain open. Continuing the discharge of untreated human waste now is the time of the Therefore, I request that the final order of Secretary Kenny be implemented and the motion to stay should be denied. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Uh, is there I, I guess uh, my next step is to give Mr. Domenici a brief opportunity to respond uh, to these uh, comments of the parties. Mr. Domenici? Madam Chair and Commissioners, um, just to go to a couple of points that um, Owen made for the Bureau, I think it's important to note that at the hearing in this matter, Owen and the Groundwater Bureau were supporting this permit renewal. And now they've really made this shift because of something happened post-hearing, which is their secretary made this decision. And all throughout the hearing, um, they and the notice of intent didn't have any statement about compliance issues. They didn't mention a word about it. Um, and then when they were asked questions, they, they didn't have the compliance concerns. But I think there's a really an overstatement of, to claim that my clients made a willful misrepresentation. My clients keep uh, manifest for every load they take. What the secretary, what the bureau wanted, was a compilation of those manifests, and that that was was done after the bureau requested it. The original documents are have an always have been in my client's possession. So there's, you know, that's really an overstatement. That's kind of what we're facing with, with this appeal, is we have these pretty normal permit activities, and then uh, someone, in either it's counsel or the secretary, chooses to greatly overstate them. I think the most clear one is, is Michelle Hunter's letter. I mean, if we didn't have that letter, there might actually be an argument. We were operating without a permit, willfully. But with that letter, if that's so far from the truth, it's that, in fact, is a misrepresentation. When the Bureau is allowing us to operate, for the Secretary to say you're operating illegal, who may, who's making the misrepresentation? The last point is the uh, New Mexico Environment Department has immunity under the Tort Claims Act. They will not pay if my client loses money. The fact that we can quantify it doesn't make any difference. It's still uh, irreparable because there's no way to collect that. The Department Bureau is not going to take the position, oh, the uh, commission overruled us, and so now we're going to write your client a check. That's, that's never going to happen. And I would just say generally in, in permit proceedings, the say is particularly important to actually allow a meaningful appeal. If you basically enforce the closure, and closure is a defined term in the permit, and, and maybe I can, we can clarify this and limit some of this. But when Mr. Wilson says, and I'm quoting, the permittee shall begin closure of the facility consistent with provisions of the discharge permit and provisions of the groundwater regulations. If the, if the department is interpreting that to mean they just cannot accept material, but they don't actually have to 
do a closure in their permit, which requires backfilling with clean soil, removing all the berms, revegetating. If they're conceding for purposes of this motion that that's not required until after the appeal, then I would certainly want that on the record. So that will protect my client from some other kind of arbitrary action saying you didn't start closing soon enough. But I would say just generally for the commission, this is an outlier. And I think you're going to believe that when you see the evidence. I think just Michelle Hunter's letter as opposed to the, commission, the secretary's findings shows this is a dispute between the secretary and the bureau. Not be, and my client's the victim. My client's the one out of 2,000 permits that happened to go through a hearing. There's many other permits with compliance issues, and they don't go through a hearing, so no one looks at them. That's another arbitrary and capricious uh, violation of my client's rights. So I think we have more than met the, the likelihood to prevail. I think we need to clarify that we're not required to begin, quote, closure. Um, and then I would suggest we should be allowed to actually operate for this limited period of time between now and the hearing. And I don't agree with anecdotal testimony that things are working well at that house facility. They worked well when 50% of the septage was controlled by my client, and a decent percentage of that still went to that facility, but the rest went to the disposal facility. Uh, and some of the other arguments, respectfully, I would just say there's really not evidence for some of that impact. And the Secretary agreed with all of the technical findings. So Mr. Hansen is sort of re-arguing some of those, but sec the Secretary didn't dispute any of the technical findings as to what would be appropriate. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. You hearing the echo? Mm. Well, if anybody's not muted, please mute. Uh, that there, I think that took care of the problem. Thank you. Um, I will uh, turn it over now to commissioners uh, for discussion. Madam Hearing Officer. Yes. This is Owen Johnson. Could I just clarify one thing that was misunderstood? Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Our, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and the Commissioners, uh, in response to Mr. Domenici, um, describing me as a, basically accusing as narcissistic of misrepresentation, that, that was not my intent. I was describing the precedent, and in that case, another party had been uh, guilty of misrepresentation. The reason it was relevant to this case is because the portion of the statute that was involved is one of those six scenarios uh, listed in the same statute that the Secretary relied upon for this order, and it allowed us to talk about how the legislative intent uh, with the fact that those are also listed as potential felonies um, made clear that that portion of the statute is taken seriously and, and should be um, something that, when invoked, is not really optional as far as, as denying the permit. It is exactly what the Secretary is obligated to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. All right. Commissioners. Madam Chair? Yes. It's been my experience throughout my career that working through the department, um, environmental departments in the states I've worked in, that it is common that there is a backlog and there is a uh, problem sometimes in getting everything finalized before the expiration date. Um, in, the, in the state of Oregon, in fact, uh, being two years over would not be excessive. What What is a question for me is there is a difference as to the good faith negotiations and the delays that may be caused by a given department. And uh, really that's the information I really don't have. Number one, do we feel confident that there has been good faith negotiations during this entire period of time that have uh, slowly but surely moved forward? And then number two, were the delays uh, significantly caused by the department or by the applicant? And uh, did they originally apply for 
uh, renewal of their permit in a um, sufficient timeline. Uh, if there's any clarification that could be provided on that, that would be very helpful for me. Mr. Seifer, I can answer those questions, and I would point you to the record. And uh, the record here is very clear on this matter. Uh, the groundwater rules provide that a permit can be administratively continued, i.e., the permittee can just continue using their old permit after expiration until the new one is granted, provided that the applicant timely applies for renewal. This applicant, the record shows, did not apply for renewal, and therefore the permit expired, and all the good faith negotiations were occurring on an expired permit. Uh, there is testimony in the record, now, I may not have these dates correct, um, I, I went the uh, the permit expired December 27, 2017. This is all from the hearing officer report and the secretary's findings of fact. Uh, the next day. December 28, 2017, NMED did an inspection and found violations regarding signage inside and out. There were no monitoring reports for three years. There were no splash pads installed as required by the 2012 permit. Um, it was not until February of 2018 that a renewal application was received. The parties continued to have discussions, but on August 27, 2018, NMED issued a notice of noncompliance because the items noted as violations in the December 2017 inspection had not yet been corrected. That was finding the fact number 44 in the secretary's order. And there were also arguments that in a testimony that in September of 2018, an NMED field technician witnessed SNR pumping grease trap waste from a restaurant. This is a waste that was no longer approved as part of their discharge permit. Uh, NMED tried to inspect the next day, but uh, the permittee denied entry to the facility. NMED subsequently was able to do tests at the facility, and their test results showed uh, significantly high levels of total petroleum hydrocarbons and other things indicating grease disposal. But SNR's manifest never showed any restaurant grease pumping. That was finding of fact number 45. So uh, I would actually suggest to you, Mr. Seifer, that in my review of the record, uh, it, it was not the department's failure to work with this permittee or the department's um, problem with uh, meeting deadlines, I would suggest it was the permittee. Excellent. Thank you for that review. Can you, speak, can you speak up or get closer to your microphone, Gabriel? Um, you're, it's very hard to hear you. Is this better? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. I got to yell at my computer. Uh, just to help frame the argument or the decision point to be made, um, at this point we have set the hearing early before us. The question is whether we allow for the, um, the continued operation of the facility. Right? 
Yes, that, the motion to stay is what is before us. Okay, now, that being said, are there specific legal criteria that this commission is supposed to consider in this decision? Um, the only thing that I can really suss out was whether there would be um, immediate environmental harm. Um, Mr. Wade, I will um, support your, your point in that uh, the motion for stay did not comply with our WQCC rules and did not contain any legal support or grounds for evaluation of the motion. And I actually did consider um, dismissing and denying it uh, just simply on those grounds because it did not contain any evidence or affidavit to support it. It did not cite to the record, and it did not provide any supporting legal analysis uh, for the motion. But I decided not to do that and to come to have this hearing so that the full commission could decide this matter. Um, I, I think that uh, Mr. Domenici and Mr. Johnson listed the four elements that we need to consider. One is the likelihood of success on the merits. The other is whether there is irreparable harm to the applicant, irreparable harm in the legal sense, not in the monetary sense. And third, uh, whether there's evidence of substantial harm to any other interested persons. And fourth, whether there is harm to the public interest. So I think those are the four prongs uh, the four elements uh, that we need to address it, as to whether we grant the motion to stay. Madam Chair, this is Kelsey Rader. I just want to really quickly go to the first prong of uh, the four point test we had in front of us the likelihood on the merits. And I agree with you and Commissioner Pfeiffer that I think that there's communications that seem to be missing from the record or from the petitioner's application in terms of communication between NMD and the petitioner that I think would help better clarify the likelihood of success. I, I, there is never a perfect record, Commissioner Rader, as you know. But I personally, when I look at this record and this order, I think it's clearly supported by substantial evidence and by the hearing officer's report. Um, I, I, I think that we've got a pending very serious threat to the environment. Uh, I think we've got evidence in this record uh, that this is this facility is discharging uh, at a higher rate of nitrogen pounds per acre than any other facility in New Mexico. It's been doing it for a very long time, and uh, more hydrogeologic information and investigation is needed if it's going to uh, continue to operate. I think there's plenty of evidence of harm to the public and to interested neighbors should this facility continue to operate. I think I don't, I'm not at all expecting, uh, I don't see a likelihood of success on the merits. I see substantial evidence supporting the Secretary's order and the bases on which he ordered it. Um, so I, I'm just not inclined to allow this facility to continue to discharge. Um, so I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that helps you get to where you need to be in terms of, um, evidence, but, uh, I don't think this is an evidentiary matter at this moment. I think this is a legal question of the four prongs, uh, required to be shown to grant or deny a motion to stay.
Madam Chair, this is Gabriel Wade again. I guess what I'm struggling with is the recommended final order of the hearing examiner. Um, that was uh, after hearing. So that hearing examiner used the same record that the secretary used to come to a final decision. And the hearing examiner actually said that as long as the applicant meets the conditions of the attachment, which you can find at the end of uh, her recommended final order, that there is no um, threat to or hazard to public health undue risk. You say it out there, Commissioner Wade. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, are you still talking? No, I am done. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I guess what I would say, Commissioner Wade, is that the, uh, the hearing officer noted the very troubling history of noncompliance for this facility. And for whatever reason, the hearing officer just may not have felt it was her role or her place to apply that particular prong uh, of the statute for uh, that, as Mr. Johnson pointed out, uh, is a non-discretionary provision in the Water Quality Act stating that uh, the permit shall not be granted if any of these uh, provisions apply, including uh, a, a significant history of noncompliance and also a, a willful disregard for environmental laws. So uh, I think the Secretary just looked at a different part of the Water Quality Act in issuing his order. I think both of them can be correct. And and I would remind this commission that a hearing officer only makes a recommendation to the secretary. The secretary is under absolutely no requirement to accept the hearing officer's recommendation. And there are New Mexico cases upholding secretary's disagreements with hearing officers. Heaven only knows witnesses, lawyers, and the absolute normal members of the public walking around can all look at the same record and reach different conclusions. So I think that's what happened here. Madam Chair, this is Pete Domenici. I would like to object to how this, this discussion is going. It's basically questions from the commission that should be going to the parties are being answered by you as an advocate for the secretary. And I'm going to request you accuse yourself from this matter. You've already made up your decision, and now you're not letting the commissioners ask questions of the parties. You're fielding every single question and giving your opinion, and I don't think that's appropriate as the chair or, or any, any other commissioner jumping in with every question and, and, and reciting a predetermined conclusion. I don't think that's appropriate. I would ask you to take under advisement. Uh, uh, disqualifying yourself, and I certainly object if we're going to go through this process and you are going to answer every question as the lawyer for the secretary. That is wholly improper. I think we've already possibly gone past the point of no return, and the record may already be ruined by what you believe conducted yourself the last 20 minutes. Thank you. Mr. Domenici, thank you for your comments. I haven't heard a commissioner ask a question of a party. And I would be happy if any commissioner would rather redirect their question to a party. Please let me know. And please, commissioner, state in your question or comment that you would like to direct it to a party. Uh, I will go back to the commissioners at this time. Madam Chair, Gabriel Wade, since I asked uh, the last maybe couple questions, I guess what I was trying to do was to frame this procedurally first. And my questions really were to you. Um, so procedurally, just so I am clear, what we're trying to determine as a commission is whether the secretary's decision was based on the, substantially based on the record below. 
No, I don't think that's what we're deciding here. I think the question of the Secretary's decision and the validity of that decision and whether it was supported by substantial evidence, I think that is our uh, July hearing, which is the challenge to the Secretary's order. All we have before us today to decide is the motion to stay filed by the permit applicant uh, because the Secretary's order uh, said that uh, the, the applicant should proceed to closure following the Water Quality Act and the groundwater regulations. Um, so that's what I think is before us right now. So you're going to wait again. Just to be clear, and I understand that that is the July meeting. I guess that was, that's what I was trying to make clear for the July meeting. Now, the uh, four standards that you laid out previously, do those apply to the July meeting or to whether a stay should be planted or not? What I heard from Mr. Domenici and Mr. Johnson are that those are the four elements that the commissioner must decide in granting a motion to stay. So that being said, again, this is Gabriel Wade, would it be helpful just to move a discussion through those, those four standards? Um, uh, you know, merits, do they have a possibility of Succeeding on the merits, I think, was the, the first standard. I think you gave your opinion regarding that. Um, I personally feel that there's probably some question to that, and that probably more heavily will be more heavily discussed in the July hearing. We get into the record more deeply. Uh, so, in my mind. Uh, whether the um, appeal will succeed on the merits is, is still a question. Okay, I, I think um, I hear your suggestion that we go through and instead of looking at, at the motion to stay as a whole, perhaps break it down so the commission can discuss each of the four elements one at a time. Commissioners, does that is that a direction you'd like to go? Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Hutchinson. I I think we should be looking at it as a question of the whole, uh, looking at at all of the criteria. Um, and I do have some specific questions that I or I would like to ask of both Mr. Johnson and Mr. Domenici. All right, why don't you proceed then, Mr. Hutchinson, and we'll come back to you, Commissioner Wade, if you wanted to add more after Commissioner Hutchinson. How's that? That's fine. I'm just trying to figure out a way to frame the discussion in general. I understand. Um, sounds like... Uh, Commissioner Hutchinson has some questions he wants to ask the parties, and then I will bring us back to the four elements and see if we can go through those one at a time. How does that sound? Very good. I'm ready. Okay. Mr. Hutchinson? Um, this question uh, goes to both Mr. Johnson and Mr. Domenici. How many permits have been renewed with the same alleged willful disregard of the act? Um, Mr. Hutchinson, I'll, I'll try first. So after I received this denial, I sent public records requests. And um, I, all I can say is there's virtually no denials. 
that had been presented. The one that, is that the Court of Appeals was a new permit, that, the one that uh, Mr. Johnson cited, the one I cited, the Root Dairy, was the, is the only other one I can identify where a uh, permit was denied, and that was with a, a neutral action by the um, hearing officer not supporting a renewal. I, my understanding is they're very rare, these permit denials. Permit renew denials, especially. Mr. Johnson. Okay. Commissioner Hutchinson, this is Owen Johnson. The, <clears throat> the precedent I cited as a, a case of an exemplifying a denial was, a, was different than what Mr. Domenici had with the dairy case. Mine was from 2011, but it was of a similar nature. It rested on the, almost the same statute. Um, but as far as actual denials for willful disregard, I'm, well, I'm sorry, can, can you tell me, did you, did you ask how many had been approved with the same problem of willful disregard or denied? I'm specifically addressing this permit. How many permits have been issued to the septic uh, transport company? How, m how many have been renewed over the period of time that they have been operating with the same alleged willful disregard of the act? Okay, I, I would say none is the answer to that then, because what constitutes willful disregard is at the discretion of the secretary, and he hasn't found out in any other cases I'm aware of except for this one. And so how many permits have been renewed? None. Not that where he found willful disregard, because if he finds that, it's denied. And so for the period of operation, how many times has this permit been renewed? This permit, I believe, has, since it started in 1987, been renewed at least four, maybe five times. Okay. Is that uh, in accordance with your record, Mr. Domenici? Yes, it is. Um, in, in this question, I guess, goes for uh, Mr. Johnson. In any previous uh, permit application, have there been any requests for hearings? Uh, for this particular permit, yes, it's gone to hearing, I believe, twice before this. And the result of the hearing, are, are these, the, so there's been three hearings total now? I think that's right, yes. And in the previous two hearings, what was the uh, recommendation by the hearing officer and the decision of the secretary? They, they both had recommendations to approve with conditions by the hearing officer, and those were adopted by the secretary at the time. <laughs> And did any of those previous hearings have notations of violations of terms and conditions? No, I'm not sure about that. I would have to research it. Could I respond to that, Mr. Hutchinson? Yes, please, Mr. Domenici. So I, I've done all three permit hearings. Um, at one of the permit hearings, there was an allegation that there had been illegal dumping by SNR or an employee into a, actually into a, an open stream. That was an allegation, sort of like this grease one. It was never decided one way or another, but it was not a basis to deny the permit. But there was actually a compliance order with penalties issue uh, around 12 or 14 years ago, and the and it was settled, and a penalty was paid, and compliance was undertaken, and at the next hearing, that permit was renewed. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, that's all I have at this point. All right. Do any other commissioners want to make general 
comments or ask general questions, or shall we start by uh, looking at the four elements? First, I'll ask, does any other commissioner want to ask questions of the parties at this time? Madam Chancellor, Kelsey Rader, I have one final question before we go to the elements. Okay. As well, um, I'm just curious if you could give us um, some information on what the law says about facing a denial based on facts that are outside of the record, such as um, the allegation that SNR was done, or excuse me, uh, using uh, pictures of grease from their local restaurant. Is that a question? Sorry, that that's cutting out. We couldn't get through the list too. Sorry, both um, both parties. Oh. Do you want to go, Owen, or I, can you? Uh, I'll go first. But can you repeat the question, please? Yes, my question was: What, the, what does the law say about uh, secretary facing a, den a permit denial based on facts um, established outside of the hearing officer's record? Okay. The the, the regulations state that the Secretary is supposed to make his decision based on the administrative record, which includes basically everything compiled up to and including the hearing officer's report. Um, and it's a, the department's position that the, the information about the oil and grease is in the record. That was discussed during testimony, so it's there. Um, if there's a possible part of that argument is that the Secretary relied on a portion of law that wasn't discussed along the way, but I don't believe that when we talk about an administrative record, we're talking about things that are should be judicially acknowledged because the law is always there. That the administrative record is about facts and fact finding and what sort of testimony was gathered and that shouldn't stray from, but there's always the law out there and we should always have access to that at any time. Thank you. So if I could answer, so the concern about the grease issue is, first of all, this facility accepted grease for over 20 years. So depending how you take a sample, you're going to find historic grease residue. The sample, so if you're suspecting grease, the facility had been out of the grease business since 2008. There's really no context to believe there would be any benefit to taking a single load of grease for a facility like this, which that isn't reflected in this. So there was an investigation, but there were no charges or there was nothing to dispute at the time this was made, and the sample results from the two other facilities were never provided to my client at that time. They weren't authorized or asked to take to split samples and to go to those locations and see what the conditions are. So it's really a due process violation in my world in that if they were going to rely on this two years later and take away a 33-year-old permit, they needed to tell my client at that time, we have reached a finding. And if you want to dispute it, this is our finding and this is how we're going to allow you to dispute it. Leaving it sitting stale in the record and not providing the information to my client or their concept of whatever the result of that investigation was until the secretary raised it, we think is completely illegal, and that's what we're going to argue in our brief. Particularly when the, the person who investigated it, Jason Herman, he was asked if there's anything with respect to compliance that would disqualify this permit holder. Uh, and Saeed is basically referring to the same statute that Owen is. I'm, so I don't argue that statute came up in the hearing. I, my contention is that the Bureau just never used that statute or suggested it should be used. And had they, and, and if they do this in the future, you can imagine if someone uh, is accused of something so out of line of their business, like hauling one load of grease over millions of gallons of septage, that will have to be adjudicated at the time. There will have to be something set up or the, the party should go to court because that's going to be used selectively by a, a secretary. He may not go through every permit file and pull something like that out. 
which I think was Mr. Hutchinson's question. But when he chooses or one goes to hearing and he wants to send a message, he may pull anything out of the record. And so uh, applicants are going to have to start contesting these things as during the permit instead of trying to comply with them during the permit and move forward. Just as so I have a quick response to that. I, I can say that the inspector, uh, Mr. Herman, did try to include the permittee at the time, uh, but was denied access on their first attempt to take the degree samples that day. And so they had to come back, I believe, the following day. And at that point, uh, the evidence that came from it is that it was 100 times higher for oil and grease than other similarly situated septic facilities that also were not allowed to dump grease, which is very strong circumstantial evidence given that they weren't allowed to put anything in there since 2008. The, uh, the other argument, though, is that regardless of what Mr. Herman said or what the hearing officer said, all of those are recommendations. Those are all things that are gathered as part of the information gathering process to build the administrative record. And ultimately, when the secretary makes his decision, that's all they are is recommendations, and he will look at everything that has taken place as a whole at that point. And that is the only formal official statement that comes out of the department. All right. Any other questions from commissioners, or shall we go to the four factors? Madam Chairman and uh, commissioners, I have one question for um Mr. Domenici, um, just to clarify on the previous discussion, I wanted to know, so your client was not aware um, that the content of the samples were what they were and being much higher for grease and hydrocarbons? No, they were never informed of that. There's nothing in the record showing they were informed of that. And they were not provided those samples? No, they weren't. And they were not provided an opportunity to go to those locations and see if they were similar. If those locations hadn't handled grease, they're completely dissimilar. So I'll I just I'm, at the hearing. I'm not asking if they were aware of the comparative samples. I just want to know oh. if they were their own sample results. Yes, they were. But that, um, Madam Commissioner, uh, what they would have liked to see is a sample somewhere else on their facility that had been receiving the same material for three decades as opposed so had they participated, that's what they would have done, not sample other locations that could be brand new. As far as we know, never taken grease. They're really dissimilar. But, yes, they were aware there was a sample being taken. They were aware of the results. They were not aware it was being compared to something that might be apple stone. Um, one more question, if I may. Um, Go ahead, in, Commissioner McWilliams. In the record, it shows that on the day that they saw that um, illegal dumping or, or proposed or illegal dumping, that they tried to access the site, and it was said that they could not access the site because it was locked and they were not in town available to unlock it. Yet there is um, in the record it says that they were able they were able to see one of the owners at the site were passing them on the road to the site in the van in their is that disputed? Yes, that is. My my clients have a two home. They want they're I don't want to say they're elderly, but they're They've been doing this a long time, so they have a second home in Rio Rancho, and they usually spend three days in Rio Rancho, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So the this was apparently the whoever saw the alleged grease saw that on Thursday. My clients were heading to Albuquerque as they do on most Fridays, and they were called to come back and open the gate. I don't know if they were seen. I don't know how far they were to Albuquerque. I don't know if that's really just been established one way or another. No questions were asked about that. There no discussion at all. Uh, but they certainly have prior plans to go to Albuquerque, and they go there most Fridays. And what the, the permit says is they'll open it under, under reasonable circumstances. It doesn't say they'll open it at any time 
certainly they have to lock it. And so they made arrangements to meet there first thing Monday morning. They opened the gate, and that's when the sample was taken. Any follow-up, Commissioner Macorios? No, I, I think that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioner questions? Madam Chair? Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry, sir. Yeah, yes. Uh, can Mr. Johnson um, answer why with such a high grease reading was there not follow-up? I mean, there must have been some reasoning why uh, with uh, with those values from the test that uh, it was decided not to follow up. Uh, this is Owen Johnson. I, Commissioner, I, I'm going to be honest. I think that's a fair question. I'm not entirely sure of the answer. I would just have to consult with my client some more and get back to you on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no other questions. I will just note at this point, Commissioner Steifer, you know, generally when we have these meetings, the attorneys are able to be in the same room and location as their clients. And because of the way we're conducting this matter, everyone is in different rooms. So everyone's at a little bit of a, a disadvantage here in terms of getting these questions and information, but um, I know everybody's trying their best. So, any other questions from commissioners? I'm sorry, Madam Chair, this, this is Owen Johnson. I did get some feedback from my client just now, if I can relay that. Please. Okay. So, the way they handled it is they did add an additional condition to the, the permit so that that would be um, – prevented from occurring again in the future if it in fact did occur. They just wanted to make sure that there were some extra safeguards. So that's how they handled it. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Larry Domingo. Commissioner Domingo, please proceed. And I'll, I'll try to approach this carefully so that it doesn't turn into a debate because I, I feel like we're already in the July hearing versus within the parameters of just arguing the motion to stay. So for... For both parties, the question revolves around, I realize that there's dispute whether they're, they are operating under an existing permit or not, but Mr. Domenici has pointed out that during the hearing, the Bureau or the Department was supportive of a permit with additional conditions. But that permit has not been issued yet. So if the Commission was to approve the motion to stay, is it a correct assumption that SNR will be operating under the 2012 permits and not any of the additional agreed upon conditions of the proposed renewed permit? Is that a correct assumption? Can I answer that, Madam Chair? I couldn't tell you. Okay. okay. I will give both uh, 
Mr. Domenici and Mr. Johnson a chance to respond to that. So go ahead, Mr. Domenici. Uh, the, the applicant or the petitioner's intent would be to operate under the 2012 permit. The main condition in the uh, in the permit that was recommended and then denied is to install some groundwater wells and then test them at various levels to find out what's taking place. And if certain conditions are met at the bottom, they would actually go to closure. Um, that's a very expensive test. I don't think my client would be able to perform that uh, and then come to a July hearing and lose the permit. That work would not be it's not necessary to close the site. So it's not in the closure portion of the permit. It's in the operating portion. So certainly if the permit is issued, they will do that. But it's what we're asking now is really, if I could clarify this, is really two things. And they can be separated. One is that we do not have to begin closure of this facility until we get a chance to have a permit appeal for a hearing. Because that would be very harmful and it would make almost moot the permit appeal. Because we don't have a facility in, that we can use even if we win the appeal. The other is to actually operate and dispose during the interim of the hearing. So I would like if at some point if the commission could separate those. Uh, so that would just be my request. And that's, that's my response. Thank you. Mr. Johnson? Uh, this is Owen Johnson. The department's position as far as what permit might be operated under is it would be neither. That is the one that only one that was ever officially adopted and in place has been expired for two years. And despite the fact that there wasn't always a severe level of enforcement going on, doesn't change that fact. The uh, Bureau has enforcement description about where to expand its resources and what might be uh, the greater good overall. And so while it was trying to put a permit together, it, it withheld some of those options to enforce, but it was always there. It could have gone after this fight for not having a, a permit if it thought that they were going to not work on renewing one. Uh, so I think that even if the, the, the motion to stay was approved, it would not put them in a, a better legal position. They would still be discharging illegally. As far as and I guess that's ultimate that's ultimately that answers the question of that by the commission. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is Gabriel Wade. May I ask a follow up question to that? Yes. If this commission, and this would be to both parties, if this commission were to grant the stay pending appeal, can this commission place conditions on the applicant? Commissioner Wade, you sort of broke up there a little bit. Would you mind getting closer to your microphone and repeating your question, please? Okay, sorry. Um, I'm yelling right into this. Um, pending appeal, could this commission place conditions on the applicant, or legally, is there no um, no way of this applicant operating under the Water Quality Act? Madam Chair and Commissioner, this is Pete Domenici. It's in my experience, it's common that. Motions for stay are tailored to specific circumstances. So I've seen motions for stay granted partially. So certain critical aspects of a facility can stay open, but not other portions. Or I've seen where, where the closure is delayed, but you cannot operate. So my, or that you could operate under the 2012 permit. So I think, in my view, the commission has uh, you have control of this case by virtue of the appeal being in front of you, and I think the motion can be tailored as you select, as you decide. This is Owen Johnson. I, I, 
I don't know any differently that it could or could not be kind of uh, have some conditions put on the the stay. Um, but I, I want to clarify that as far as the actual wording about closure and the expense involved, that the wording is to begin closure. And as we all know in law, there can be some fine definitions about that. And I think the most critical portion of that to the department is that there are not being discharges made to this site, the facility owned by SNR septic, where the danger to the groundwater actually um, takes place. Now, can they be in the pr process of beginning to close by just not discharging there? Potentially. Um, and then let the appeal play out and decide if the actual closure portions that are laid out that are expensive, that are laid out in the permit as far as erasing the berms and whatnot, perhaps that could come later. But that's something that I would want to talk to my client about a little more. Thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? All right. Well, uh, may I suggest that I miss somebody? No. Okay. Well, um, commissioners, so uh, what is your pleasure? Do we want to have a motion? Do we want to talk about the uh, different prongs on the motion to stay? Madam Chair, Commissioner Hutchinson. Commissioner Hutchinson. The, uh, the this previous discussion um, was something that, that I was contemplating myself. Uh, I I am inclined to to make a, a motion to grant the stay only in regards no discharges to the permit area and um, and no requirement for closure be implemented. So that I'm, I'm kind of throwing that out for discussion at this point. This is um, I, I agree with that conclusion, depending on how much detail we want to get into for discussion. Um, that, that's basically uh, the thing that I have to make as well. All right. Hi, Madam Chair. Uh, this is Commissioner Rader. I also agree with Commissioner Hutchinson and Commissioner Wade. So I'm going to see if I can. Uh, so we're. Uh, we're is this a motion from Commissioner Hutchinson to grant the stay of the Secretary's order to the extent that the order would have required action to implement closure other than the portion of the Secretary's order prohibiting operation and further discharges at the facility. Is that what you were proposing, Commissioner Hutchinson, seconded by Wade? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I, I wasn't proposing it necessarily as a motion, but I will do so now. And Gabriel Wade, I will officially second. A discussion by commissioners. Madam Chair, commissioners, um, I agree with this because I think that I am not prepared or comfortable with allowing continued discharge into this facility. But I also think closure, as in the term of reclamation or construction work to close the facility, should be 
halted until the hearing can be made in July. Uh, but I want to make it very clear that this charge and the operation of the facility should continue to be halted. That was Commissioner McWilliams. Thank you, Commissioner McWilliams. Any other commissioner want to uh, comment or discuss this? Madam Chair and members of the commission, this is Kelsey Rader. Um, I agree with uh, what Commissioner McWilliams has said. I think that the petitioner has met his burden of proof under the uh, four-prong rule for uh, motion to stay. And um, I look forward to the appeal in summer. Thank you, Commissioner Rader. Uh, any other commissioners? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Larry Dominguez. This was a little bit more of a question back to Commissioner Hutchinson. Um, the way you framed your motion of no discharges, would the flip side of that be that SNR can continue to function, but any of the loads picked up then would, would go to a wastewater treatment facility, is that correct? Yes, Commissioner Dominguez, that, that's correct. I, I don't think that's part of my motion, though. It's an assumption that they can continue collecting septics and they can dispose of it lawfully. Okay, thank you. I I appreciate that clarification. Any other discussion by the commissioners? I guess I'll just say my inclination is to deny the motion to stay um, and leave the secretary's order that they not operate and they begin they not operate at this facility and they begin closure uh, as described by Mr. Johnson to mean as not discharging. But I'm 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 willing to go along with Commissioner Hutchinson's motion as long as uh, I just want, I want to make sure that I understand it because granting the stay of the secretary's order. with the exception that we're leaving in place the part of the order that prohibits discharging at the facility, we're, we're staying any portion that we would require active implementation of closure and we're staying any suggestion that they may not operate to the extent that operation, they can operate as long as they don't discharge at their facility. Is that what we have as a motion? Madam Chair, Commissioner Hutchinson, yes. And for the okay. record, this is Gabriel it's, Wade. It's something uh, that um, I guess it's uh, having the baby, which happens frequently in the Water Quality Control Commission meeting. Thank you for that clarification, Commissioner Hutchinson. Commissioner Wade, did you want to add to that? Just that, that the, the way you phrase the motion, that's what I would have second. So that is my understanding of, of it as well. Uh, 
Um, before we vote on this, I just want to give our council, Robert Ch Sanchez, an opportunity um, to provide us any legal guidance or direction that that he thinks we might need uh, as we consider this matter or vote on this motion. Thank you, Chairman Pruitt. I, I do have some comments. Uh, if you will refer to the petitioner's motion to say the proceeding, uh, he di he's differed in, at this hearing somewhat from what he, what he asked for or the relief that he asked for in his actual motion. In the motion, he simply asked for a stay of the implementation of the Secretary's order pending the appeal. And if you go to the page 19 of the final order of the Secretary, it has three elements. Uh, the one that's most relevant to us, or the one that's only immediate relevant to us, is the third point, which is the permittee shall begin closure of the facility consistent with the provisions of the discharge permit BP465 and the provisions of the groundwater regulations. Mr. Domenici earlier um, in this hearing basically bifurcated that and said, I'm, I'm now essentially asking for a stay of the order, but also uh, ask you to consider continued operation. That differs from his, what he requested for in his actual motion. So what affects what you're, what, what you guys are now, forgive me, what the commission is now doing is confirming that pleading to the proper arguments and, and, and discussion at this hearing. That, that's certainly your prerogative. Uh, but the, or, so, so you're essentially in, in what you're suggesting in your motion is also a continuation of that bifurcation. As I understand the motion is that the beginning of the closure is to be halted, but there is to be no discharge. Uh, there can be lawful discharge as long as it's not discharged to the facility that was complained of in the, in the, in the lower proceeding. That's my understanding. Thank you, thank you, uh, Council. Commissioners, any uh, continued discussion or, or would you like to uh, vote on the motion? I think I'm seeing Bruce Thompson. I'm read, reading his lips to say he's calling the question for a vote. Is that correct, Commissioner Thompson? Yes. That is correct. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Barnes, would you please read the roll call for a vote? Yes, certainly. Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Candelaria. Uh, yes. Commissioner Sturton. Yes. Commissioner Dominguez. Yes. Commissioner Hutchinson? Yes. Commissioner McWilliams? Yes. Commissioner Musharafi? Yes. Commissioner Patton? Yes. Madam Chair Pruitt? Yes. Commissioner Rader? Yes. Commissioner Cipher? Yes. Commissioner Thompson? Yes. Commissioner Timmons? Yes. And Commissioner Wade? Madam Chair, it passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. And uh, now there is the question of who will write up this order uh, for the commission? I, I'm going to, because this has has been uh, such a complicated matter and there are so many parties, I'm going to ask our council to try to get me an order on this um, in about a week, uh, and then uh, we'll handle it that way. Will that work for you, Mr. Sanchez? Chairman Pruitt, it will work. I just one point of clarification. On the second element of the order, on the question of that, uh, the stuff that company can operate so long as they don't discharge at that facility, 
are we then implicitly saying that they can continue to operate under discharge for the BP-465 insofar as that's not inconsistent with uh, what the commission has now decided? Uh, that, my understanding is that permit expired, but uh, that the uh, permit he has offered to comply with the 2012 version of that permit, even though technically it is no longer effective. It, it, would you agree with that, Mr. Domenici and Mr. Johnson? Uh, Madam Chair, this, this is Roman Johnson. I would, I, I would suggest that they, that they aren't. Okay, let me put it this way. If the permit follows the land, and if they aren't discharging as the permitted site, then they don't need a permit. I don't think the other haulers that go to the wastewater treatment plant need a permit to discharge there. And I, I was going to say something similar. They, our operations are not governed by this discharge permit. It governs the facility. And uh, I prefer not to really comment on our operations. They're, they're really not... Other than dumping at this facility or operating there, everything else we do is outside of the scope of the permit and and the, the appeal. I, I think it's, as long as the order is clear, we cannot operate at the facility, including dumping uh, or disposing, whatever we want to use. And and but that we don't have to initiate closure. I think it should be a fairly simple order. One one, one additional matter of clarification then simply that. Any uh, any operation will simply be well, not simply, but will be in conformance with our applicable groundwater regulations. Do you have any objection to that? No, that's fine. Okay, neither do I. All right. So, Mr. Sanchez, you have what you need to draft the order. I will do that. All right. Thank you very much. So, I think we have completed number six on our agenda. Uh, we move to number seven, our next meeting and upcoming matters proposed for May 12, 2020. Um, as you know, uh, during the, our current situation and the governors and Department of Health, uh, health emergency orders uh, limit what we can do. We need to be mindful of the Open Meetings Act requirements. Things change on a daily basis, so please hold May 12th uh, open and available for a meeting. We are planning it, and we do have some business to conduct, but uh, if, if conditions change, we will have to, you know, go with the flow, as we say. So, uh it seems like this uh, worked pretty well today for this meeting. Uh, our May 12th would be a more substantive matter, and so we'll just have to see if we can uh, make arrangements and, and what the situation is regarding the public health orders uh, and the Open Meetings Act in May. So thank you all for attending and for working with these uh, sometimes challenging new technologies. I'm glad we were able to decide this matter today, and I will now um, adjourn the meeting at 12.30. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Thank you. Montoya. Has left the meeting.